this next panel is being moderated by uh, my colleague here at Berkeley Research Group, uh, David Lewin. And uh, uh, just to give David a brief introduction, he is a professor of management and uh, organizational behavior at uh, the UCLA Anderson School of Management. And he is extremely well published. He has published uh, more than 20 books and more than 150 scholarly articles. And uh, he is currently working on some forthcoming books. And so uh, David is gonna lead the, uh, the panel on uh, labor issues, uh, employment issues, and uh, ERISA. And so with that, let me turn it over to David to uh, just get the panel started. Thank you so much to everyone for participating. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, I appreciate that. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. We can hear you. Oh, excellent. Very good. Thanks so much. Well, uh, good morning or good afternoon, depending upon which part of the country you are in. Uh, I might say that uh, Jeff mentioned my professorial job, but <laughs> I'm also a managing director and head of the labor and employment practice at the um, Berkeley Research Group. For this uh, panel, uh, we're going to be focusing on uh, ERISA labor and employment, as the title suggests. And I want to introduce uh, two other panelists uh, to you. The three of us will be each making some comments and hopefully we'll have Q&A and discussion about some of the matters that we cover here. Uh, Randy Moon uh, has uh, more than three decades of experience uh, as an attorney and a corporate human resources uh, executive. He's been an ERISA fiduciary for 15 years at uh, three Fortune 100 uh, companies, which are, or were CSX, Archer Daniels, Midland, and uh, Lowe's. He's currently a managing director with the Berkeley Research Group and is, uh, in addition, teaching a uh, master's level labor relations class as an adjunct professor at uh, the University of South Carolina. Darla Moore School of Business. He served on many councils and boards uh, focused in particular on ERISA. And he'll lead off our comments in just a moment. Um, Seth Kaufman is a partner at uh, Fisher and Phillips uh, in the New York City uh, office. Uh, Fisher and Phillips is a national labor and employment uh, law firm. Interestingly, Mr. Kaufman's practice uh, focuses on representing employers in their labor and employment matters, ranging from large corporations to small startups across a range of industries. And that's a particularly interesting background. He doesn't confine himself just to uh, the large companies. Um, Seth in particular advises employers on wage and hour issues of all types and sorts. And he's going to be talking some today about uh, key issues in the area of wages and hours. And then after Seth, I'm gonna make a few remarks about two issues, one of which uh, has been the subject of not only class actions, but is currently the subject of new and portending legislation in a variety of states. We'll get to that I want to spend a little time with you on today is one that has not been the subject of class actions, but may become the subject of class actions. And that is challenges to the reasonableness the word that is used in the courts of executive compensation. Usually the matter being are some executives overpaid. So with that, let me turn it over to Randy Moon with his focus on uh, ERISA. Randy? All right, now can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you, David, and thank you all for joining us today. I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you. Uh, I recognize that some of you may not be well versed in employee benefits law, so I'm gonna provide a brief introduction uh, to the area. Since its enactment in 1974, the Employee Retirement Income Security Act, known as ERISA, has been the subject of extensive interpretation and legislation or litigation. ERISA was developed largely out of a concern in Congress that abuses in the private pension system were denying pensions to many workers. So most of the provisions of the law are directed at safeguarding pensions. But the law goes beyond safeguarding pensions to also provide protections for participants in what are known as welfare benefit plans, 
such as medical accident, death, disability plans. Key players in the management of pension and welfare benefit plans are also known as fiduciaries. I could spend hours walking through ERISA, its history and its evolution, but since I only have a few minutes, let me focus on litigation around who is a fiduciary and what are his or her obligations. Who is a fiduciary? ERISA requires every benefit plan to designate at least one fiduciary in the plan document. Quite often the name fiduciary is identified by job title or position, not by the person's name. Fiduciary status can also be triggered by a person's actions or responsibilities. A person is a fiduciary under ERISA to the extent that the person has or exercises any discretionary authority or control over management or administration of the plan, has any discretion authority over the management or disposition of the plan's assets, or gives investment advice regarding plan assets for direct or indirect compensation or has the authority to do so. What are the key duties of ERISA fiduciaries? <clears throat> First is the duty of loyalty. All ERISA fiduciaries must act solely in the interest of plan participants and plan beneficiaries with the exclusive purpose of providing benefits and paying reasonable plan expenses. This is known as the exclusive benefits rule. They have a duty to act prudently. ERISA requires fiduciaries to act with the care, skill, prudence, and diligence under the circumstances then prevailing that a prudent person acting in a like capacity and familiar with such matters would use in the conduct of an enterprise of a like character and with like aims. What does that all mean? Uh, in other words, the duty to act prudently doesn't mean do the best you can. Instead, it's closer to a prudent expert standard. That's a high standard to meet. Uh, this is a good reason to regularly educate fiduciaries on their responsibilities and how to fulfill them. It's also a good reason to follow a structured fiduciary process in executing fiduciary standard, uh, responsibilities. There's also the duty to diversify plan assets. If the fiduciary is involved in, involved in directing or managing plan assets or hiring a service provider that manages plan assets, the fiduciary must make sure the plan assets are diversified in a way that minimizes the risk of large losses. For a divine contribution plan, such as a 401k plan, that lets participants choose their own investments from a menu, the options available on the menu must be diverse. And then finally, the duty to act in accordance with the plan documents. In addition to loyalty, prudence, and diversification of plan assets, ERISA fiduciaries must act according to the terms of the benefit plan documents. As long as the plan contains provisions that are not contrary to ERISA, the plan provisions must always be followed. So now let's explore ERISA litigation. We'll start with 401k plans. There's a long history of cases related to 401k plans where plaintiffs claim fiduciaries acted imprudently and not in the interest of plan participants in choosing and monitoring plan investments. ERISA imposes the duty to act prudently on fiduciaries. The duty establishes a standard that focuses on the process by which decisions are made rather than the results of those decisions. So in other words, fiduciaries can actually act prudently yet achieve poor results. Another line of 401k cases relates to the fees charged by investment providers and or record keepers. The common argument is fiduciaries of large plans should have used their tremendous buying power to exact lower fees, and they would achieve that if they put the business out to bid every three years. Having been a fiduciary, I will say I wish it was that simple. Uh, being a fiduciary is, is not an easy role to play, and it's not simple. Let's look at defined benefit plans, pension plans, uh, in particular focusing on actuarial equivalents. We're starting to see more cases now around the actuarial tables used by defined benefit plans in determining whether benefits are actuarial equivalent. In other words, the normal form of payment in a defined benefit plan is a single life annuity. Benefit alternatives paid in a form other than a single life annuity, such as joint and survivor annuities, must be the actuarial equivalent of a single life annuity. Actuarial tables are updated periodically, but not that often. 
to take into account enhanced mortality assumptions? An interesting question. The actuarial, the actuarial table to be used is specified in the plan document. It is up to the fiduciary to administer the plan according to its terms. Amending the plan to change the actuarial table is a set law or plan sponsor function, not an administrative function. So where is the fiduciary issue here? I guess stay tuned. Another area uh, where we're seeing more litigation now is uh, related to ERISA preemption. The next term of the Supreme Court the court will hear arguments in the case of Rutledge versus Pharmaceutical Care Management Association over whether an Arkansas law regulating pharmacy benefit managers is preempted by ERISA. The Eighth Circuit Court ruled that ERISA did preempt state law. Apparently, the federal government argued in an amicus brief that the law wasn't preempted. So this is an important case because a number of states would like to regulate PBMs because of the amount of money involved and the lack of transparency associated with PBM fees. Plan sponsors don't like to see any erosion of the ERISA preemption. They don't want to have to deal with 50 different sets of rules to administer their plans. COBRA cases. Over the last few years, there have been a string of cases around in alleged improper COBRA notices. Many of these cases have been brought by the same law firm in Florida. The allegation is the notices provided by very large companies did not follow the Department of Labor model notice, even though there's no requirement that you have to use that notice. And so therefore the plaintiffs cannot figure out how to claim their COBRA benefits. And of course, the story goes, they incurred expensive medical claims that would have otherwise been covered. In one case involving the Walmart health plan, it came to light that some of the plaintiffs had no intention of signing up for COBRA coverage. It's quite expensive. It's normally 102% of the premium. Another plaintiff had coverage under her partner's plan and the plaintiff who claimed she had incurred costs associated with a healthcare issue did not, in fact, have the medical procedure until long after the COBRA time period elapsed. So in other words, all of these plaintiffs lack standing. A number of companies have settled these lawsuits, I assume to avoid the hassles of litigation, but Walmart did not. In Bryant versus Walmart, which was in the US District Court for the Southern District of Florida, Walmart challenged the plaintiff's standing, welcomed the assistance of amicus briefs filed by a few organizations, including the American Benefits Council, joined by the US Chamber of Commerce, and won in a big way. Within a few weeks of the dismissal with prejudice in that case, a number of other COBRA cases were voluntarily dismissed by the plaintiff's attorneys. Is this the end of these COBRA cases? Again, stay tuned. Functional fiduciary cases. Over the last year or so, I've testified as an expert in two de facto or functional fiduciary cases. In one case, I was hired by plaintiff's counsel and opined that a third party administrator exercised discretion in the administration of the plan and the management of plan assets. And so therefore it was a fiduciary, even though their agreement with the plan sponsor stated that they were not a fiduciary. The court found for the plaintiff in that case. In the other case, I was hired by defense counsel and opined that a health insurance company operated within its mandate in reviewing and making determinations with respect to submitted claims. And so therefore was not a fun uh, functional fiduciary. The court found for the defendant and dismissed this case. Recently, I've seen a few more of these de facto or functional fiduciary cases popping up. And so I'm paying close attention to those. A few uh, other areas of litigation I'm watching now. Recently, some cases have been brought claiming that participant data is a plan asset and therefore should be treated as such from a fiduciary standpoint. These cases relate to plan record keepers such as Fidelity using the participant data in their possession to market its financial products. It'll be interesting in these cases to see, to see how the plaintiffs overcome the definition of plan assets in ERISA's regulations. One area related to participant data that may get some traction relates to cybersecurity. 
I can see the argument made that if there is a data security breach, the fiduciaries did not act prudently in monitoring their planned service providers, cybersecurity process, processes, and safeguarding participant data. Also, there have been cases brought against IBM related to uh, problems with their microchip division, Johnson & Johnson related to asbestos and talc, uh, Boeing related to the 737 MAX, and Target related to ill-fated expansion into Canada. These cases are claiming that the fiduciaries should have taken action when they knew they had inside knowledge about the potentially bad things going on in their companies that could impact the stock price. Obviously, the plans had company stock as an investment option in the 401k plans. This seems to be the reincarnation of the stock drop, stock drop cases from a number of years ago. The dismissal of the case against Target was affirmed by the Eighth Circuit that cited the 2014 Supreme Court ruling in Fifth Third Bank Corp versus Dudenhofer. Dudenhofer requires plaintiffs alleging ESOP fiduciaries breach their fiduciary duties to point to an alternative action in line with securities law available to the fiduciaries that they couldn't have concluded would do more harm than good. The court in Target did not buy the participants' theory that a prudent fiduciary wouldn't conclude that disclosing the expansion into Canada's, the problems related to the expansion into Canada would cause harm since the stock would drop some anyway. Disclosing it early would result in less harm, was the argument. It will be interesting to see in the IBM, Johnson & Johnson, and Boeing cases how the plaintiff, plaintiff's attorneys attempt to get around the Dudenhofer ruling. And finally, what about coronavirus issues? Here are a few things I would be paying attention to. The impact of leave policies and furloughs on plan eligibility, breaks in service, et cetera. In 401k plans, what about the payment of outstanding loans, uh, distributions? Also, if a participant stopped paying on their 401k loans and had been called back to work, what processes does the plan uh, go through to re-amortize those loans? I would pay a lot of attention to what's happening in welfare plans, in particular behavioral health claims. We've all heard about the mental health impacts of being isolated and shut in. How will that translate to the plans? I think we will begin to see more mental health parity claims. Mental health parity is a federal law that generally prevents group health plans and health insurance issuers from imposing less favorable benefit limitations on mental health or substance abuse disorder benefits than on medical surgical benefits. For those of you who advise plans, this is an area of compliance worth looking at. Also disability plans. There may be more claims for disability associated with mental health and anxiety issues. Those are very difficult to, to, to determine and frankly can be subject to abuse. Some of the most difficult claims to adjudicate in the disability plan area are mental health and soft tissue. Why? Because the injury or illness is not visible. I hope this has been helpful. Feel free to reach out to me if I can help you or if you have any questions. David, I turn it back to you. Thank you, Randy. And uh, I took the liberty as you were finishing up your remarks of launching a, a poll on the question, right. which of the following types of ERISA class action lawsuits do you expect to increase as a result of the impacts of COVID-19? And uh, we can come back in a while and uh, take a look and see what those poll numbers look, look like. All right. Thank you. Uh, so now let me turn it over to our colleague Seth Kaufman, who is going to focus uh, in particular on wage and hour class actions and current and uh, prospects. Seth? All right. Thank you, David. And, and thank you, Randy. And thanks, everybody, for being here today. Um, and uh, I appreciate the opportunity to speak. Um, uh, as, as David said, my practice focuses on uh, representing employers and their wage and hour matters. Um, a lot of this is consulting um, employers and trying to keep them out of trouble, uh, but uh, unfortunately, occasionally, our, our clients do get sued, and uh, we represent them in their um, uh, wage and hour litigation, which very often is are, are class and collective actions. Um, these are uh, cases involving um, worker pay. Um, this include allegations of salaried employees, uh, 
claiming they're improperly classified as exempt from overtime, um, hourly employees claiming that they're being forced to work off the clock and, and owed um, wages and overtime, um, allegations that independent contractors um, are really employees, um, and a whole host of technical uh, wage and hour violations that can pop up under various state laws, um, and, and usually I deal with, with that under New York law. Um, I've now been speaking and, and writing a fair amount over the last few months, and, and my message from April on, uh, as soon as the, the economic issues caused by COVID uh, really became clear that this was going to be a, a long-lasting um, business disruption and, and disruption to um, a, a lot of employment, um, has really been the same, and, and that's get ready for um, an increase in these types of wage and hour class actions. Um, I think it's an axiom in, in the employment litigation world that um, when there is business disruption, um, economic disruption causing people to lose their jobs, um, employment litigation tends to follow. Um, we very much saw this after the financial crisis in, in 2008. Um, we looked at the the number of dockets for federal wage and hour class and collective action cases, and they, they steadily increased starting in 2009 um, and into the 2010s. Um, and we're likely to see that uh, really compounded in the post-COVID world. Um, I think Randy touched on this a little bit um, in terms of the ERISA um, issues, but uh, COVID put a lot of companies in, in uncharted territory um, when dealing with their employees. Um, disruption from COVID came suddenly in March and, and a lot of employers in a matter of days were trying to figure out what to do with their business, what to do with their employees. Um, and they were trying to make uh, decisions um, very quickly, um, and large scale decisions very quickly. Um, and so even, um, and, and some of these decisions, I mean, whether to lay off employees, whether to furlough employees, whether to have employees um, take a pay cut, whether to send out war notices for um, uh, layoffs and, and facility closings. Um, and, and even the most sophisticated employers um, are susceptible to, to making mistakes in dealing with their, um, with their employees and these sort of wage and hour matters. Um, and that's the case even in the best of times, um, and certainly in, in the COVID world, um, uh, where employers are making these, these significant decisions very quickly, um, that there's always the chance that, that mistakes were made, and, and uh, plaintiffs and plaintiffs' counselors are going to try to um, uh, uh, jump on that, and we're likely to see that uh, these types of cases will really, um, really increase um, as sort of things shake out, and things get back to normal. Um, uh, federal uh, wage and hour law, the Fair Labor Standards Act has a, a three-year statute of limitations. Um, in New York, it's, it's six years. So um, even if we don't see it uh, today, these cases um, will be brought down, uh, will be coming down the pike. Um, and they will be class and collective cases uh, because a lot of these decisions uh, were made affecting a large class of employees. And those are really, um, those cases are really susceptible to, to class and collective certification. Um, and so, you know, as, as we see that these cases are, are probably going to be um, increasing, um, my advice to, to a lot of clients has been that if you can do it, and obviously there's a lot of disruption uh, to, to everyone's business right now, um, now's a, a good time to take a look at your your wage and hour practices, your policies, um, even if you've made certain mistakes in, in March or April or May um, and dealing with COVID related issues or there were issues even before that, now's a good time to, to take a look and see what you're doing right, what you're doing wrong. Um, because A, the reduced liability um, that may have started and, and B, it, it makes it uh, less likely that a, a terminated or harmed or disgruntled employee um, will step forward to file a class action lawsuit. Um, all it takes is one employee um, uh, to file a broadly worded class action and, and next thing you know, a company is uh, defending numerous wage and hour issues that have popped up in that case. Um, so we know these cases are coming. So you know, I've, I've really been telling everybody I can, trying to shout it from the rooftops, take a look at what you're doing see if you can do things better and, and 
um, in, in a year from now, uh, you're, you'll look back at it and, um, and uh, be thankful that you did that. Um, and, and so I'm going to switch gears a, a little bit now, and, and those are my sort of uh, COVID-related advice, which I've been giving out a lot. Um, but I also want to talk about um, a recent development in, in employment uh, collective actions that I think is really going to take uh, center stage over the coming years and that I, I think will be interesting. Um, and I keep saying class and collective actions, and, and for those who are unfamiliar, uh, collective action is, is a type of um, multi-plaintive action that is mostly brought under the uh, Federal Fair Labor Standards Act um, for unpaid minimum wage or overtime. Um, uh, for example, when, as I said before, when hourly employees are saying they're forced to work off the clock or a lot of times misclassification cases, uh, salaried employees are, are claiming they should be paid um, uh, alleged uh, unpaid overtime. Um, the FLSA specifically authorizes um, in the statute and plaintiffs to bring a claim on behalf, on behalf of him or herself um, and other employees, which they say are similarly situated to the employee. Um, and this, uh, this type of collective action uh, differs from your standard class action brought under uh, Rule 23 in federal court or, or a similar state statute. Um, and a class action under, let's say, Rule 23, uh, the universe of class members uh, exists unless uh, someone affirmatively opts out uh, from the class action. Um, in a collective action, once a class is preliminarily certified, uh, notice is sent to the, to the universe of, of putative collective class members uh, to solicit them to opt in affirmatively into the collective action, um, where they will actually be uh, party plaintiffs to the case, not just uh, absent class members like they would be in a, in a more traditional um, uh, class action. Um, the disadvantage uh, for plaintiffs um, on, on that side is that uh, the opt-in mechanism can lead to a much lower participation uh, depending on the size of the class. I mean, the 10% of the putative class could, could opt in. Um, on the flip side, and what makes this advantageous to to plaintiffs uh, to increase uh, uh, the size of the class is that uh, preliminary certification or, or what's called conditional certification uh, of a collective action is, is far easier to attain from, uh, from a district court uh, than uh, full class certification under, under Rule 23. Um, the plaintiff must only make a, uh, a modest showing that um, uh, the employee, the putative class are, are similarly situated to one another. Uh, judges won't address credibility. It, it really comes down to um, uh, almost um, sort of a, a pleading standard if the plaintiff puts forward uh, sufficient evidence that um, sort of to make a prima facie case that, that the um, putative class are similarly situated, the court will conditionally certify the class. Um, uh, after conditional certification, notice will be sent um, to the putative class, allowing the, the class to opt in. Uh, discovery uh, for the class will proceed. Um, and only after discovery will the court really look at the evidence to determine whether uh, the class should remain certified or whether uh, the, the class should be uh, decertified. Um, and I only give that background to, to say that it's this relatively low burden um, for plaintiffs to get to sort of class-wide uh, discovery that, that employers um, really fear. The, the idea that if somebody brings forward a, a potential large um, collective action, either uh, you know, among mul multiple states, uh, nationwide for large employers, um, the, the burden to get to, to discovery can be low, to class-wide discovery can be low. And, and that can obviously cause a lot of disruption to the business, heavy litigation costs, and it's really something that um, employers fear and really want to stay away from. Um, and even with a lower participation rate, um, the largest of collection, collective actions can reach uh, tens of thousands of employees. I mean, obviously that's um, for, the, for the largest of employers, but it, it can still reach a large, uh, large group of employees. Um, and so really employers want to you know, really want to avoid these cases at all costs, um, especially uh, collective actions that 
can span multiple states or even reach all of their operations across the country. Um, and, and one of the latest uh, developments in this area of the law um, stems from a Supreme Court case that I'm sure most of the class action attorneys um, that, that are speaking are familiar with. It's, it's the Bristol Myers Squibb case, um, uh, which, which held that a, um, a California state court did not have personal jurisdiction um, over a non-resident defendant uh, for the claims of non-resident plaintiffs um, in a mass tort action. Um, and slowly but surely, the implications of this case have been extending outside um, that particular context. I believe there was a, a case in, in March, a circuit court case that uh, held that uh, Bristol-Myers didn't, didn't preclude nationwide, um, a nationwide class action under Rule 23. But the, the implication on, on nationwide or multi-state uh, collective actions has been a bit more muddled. Um, because of that one uh, distinction that between collective and class actions, uh, class members in a collective action are party plaintiffs to the case, uh, a little bit similar to maybe a mass tort action rather than simply um, absent class members in a Rule 23 uh, case. So a lot of district courts have, have been asked to decide whether um, uh, Bristol Myers uh, precludes uh, nationwide or multi state. Uh, FLSA collective actions. Um, sort of before this case, I think it was really a given, um, both among defense attorneys and, and plaintiffs' attorneys, that there was no uh, real jurisdictional defense here. And so uh, when this case was decided in 2017, all of a sudden, defense counsel has really been pressing this issue. Um, and uh, it's, it's turned into really uh, decisions have, have come all over the place. I mean, within circuits, um, district courts have been coming out both ways. Um, I think it's the first, second, third, sixth, uh, eighth, and ninth. All have district courts within those circuits who have sort of come out on divergent ends of, determ of, of deciding whether Bristol Myers precludes um, nationwide collective actions um, on, a, on a personal jurisdiction uh, defense. And, and some districts have judges that have gone opposite ways. Um, and, and those judges who, um, who have decided that um, Bristol, Myers, Bristol Myers precludes a nationwide collective action have really focused on uh, really the, the letter of the law as it comes to personal jurisdiction um, uh, in order for any district court to, to have personal jurisdiction. It needs to have either specific or, or general jurisdiction. And, and if non-resident um, party uh, opt-ins or party plaintiffs um, and uh, defendant, um, and there is no general jurisdiction over the defendant employer in, in that state, then the non-resident um, employees uh, don't, have, uh, uh, don't have valid claims in that state. Um, courts uh, sort of looking the other way have decided that really the purpose of the FLSA was to um, was to decide, um, uh, was to cover uh, nationwide wage and hour issues and that nothing in the FLSA text um, really precludes or, or sets a territorial limitation on where collective actions um, uh, can be filed and, and the group of similarly situated plaintiffs who can join a collective action. Um, it's also uh, important to note that um, even in courts in the first bucket who have, who have said Bristol Myers uh, could preclude uh, nationwide FLSA collective actions, they, they've, some of them have carved out the idea that um, there could still be a nationwide or multi-state collective action if the, um, if the district court had uh, general jurisdiction over the defendant employer. So really looking to, to the, the home state of the, of the company, um, which could lead to not only forum shopping, but plaintiff shopping, making sure that uh, plaintiff's counsel uh, finds a plaintiff in the right jurisdiction to file a large, um, large multi-state or nationwide uh, uh, FLSA collective action. Um, but uh, regardless, I mean, it's, it's kind of amazing um, that uh, this issue is so, so squarely down the middle I mean, within circuits, within districts that judges are coming out on both sides. So 
it, it really will be interesting to see uh, who the first circuit court is uh, to make a decision on this, um, uh, and and how they come at, how they come uh, come out will will have a large effect um, on how future district courts decide the issue. And and really, given the split on this, it's it's really almost inevitable that um, we're going to see a circuit split on the issue, and and that ultimately this will be teed up for the Supreme Court to decide um, in a few years time. Um, but in the meantime, you know, this, this issue, I mean, very much may depend on where the case is filed and which judge a, a case gets assigned to within a district, uh, whether um, a company has this sort of successful defense. Um, so to sort of sum up um, the two issues I spoke, uh, to spoke about, uh, spoke about on the one hand, um, we're likely to see more wage and hour class and collective actions, but in the, in the post COVID world, but on the other hand, um, one of the most common and feared type of, of mass plaintiff action, the nationwide or multi-state uh, FLSA collective action uh, may be limited. So it, it really will be uh, uh, an interesting few years in, in this um, area of the law. And with that, I'll, I'll turn it back over to David. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Seth. And I might uh, say for those attending, um, each of us uh, prepared a couple of polling questions and I uh, launched the two for Randy. Uh, and we have responses to that. And I've launched the first one for Seth and I'm about to launch the second one. Uh, and we'll uh, give the results, summarize the results uh, before the uh, session uh, concludes. So with that, let me now turn to the two-headed topic that I want to spend a few minutes uh, on with you. The first involves independent contractor versus um, employee status. And over the years, um, in this uh, century so far in particular, there have been a substantial number of class action-based challenges brought by independent contractors uh, to the companies and sometimes the nonprofit organizations and government organizations with which they have contracts. And their claim, their allegation is that they are really employees and should be reclassified, covered by benefits, uh, subject to overtime where applicable, and, uh, and so forth. And these class actions have ranged across a variety of industries. Uh, insurance agents uh, have brought these actions in various uh, parts of the country, package delivery uh, folks have brought these actions in various parts of the country. Uh, equipment installers and service technicians uh, have done so. Um, some of you may know of the famous series of cases involving uh, FedEx, whose uh, FedEx Express business that delivers packages and so forth to offices, there the delivery people are employees. But if you got a package from FedEx delivered to your home or your apartment, um, that's done by FedEx Ground, and FedEx Ground, uh, those folks who do that uh, delivery service are independent contractors. There's been about 15 years of litigation involving just FedEx by itself. But a case that I think is more telling is one that was finally decided in 2017, and it's a case known as uh, Super Shuttle Incorporated versus uh, the State of California Attorney General and uh, Employee Development Department. And this case is interesting because it began, uh, if memory serves, in 2011, uh, several thousand uh, super shuttle drivers, and super shuttle basically provides transportation to and from airports, as you may know, filed a class action suit claiming that they should be reclassified as employees. The Berkeley Research Group was retained by uh, Super Shuttle, the defendant in that matter. Uh, and the work that was done there was mainly an analysis of terabytes of GPS data in order to determine the extent to which the drivers of the Super Shuttle vans had some discretion, some autonomy, some independent decision making, as opposed to being tightly controlled by the company. And in the analysis, it was quite clear the drivers could uh, choose the routes they wanted to drive. They didn't have to have prescribed routes by super shuttle. They could choose to turn off their telecommunications uh, equipment if they wanted to do so to take various breaks at various times. 
They could turn down jobs from dispatch, which is a very unusual thing in that kind of industry. They could hire sub drivers. They could use their vans for other purposes. So the parties settled without a change of classification. And here is where it got more interesting. Um, two months after that settlement, the state of California's Employee Development Department, that's a fancy name for a labor department, uh, sent a notice to uh, Super Shuttle with an invoice saying, uh, you may have settled this voluntarily, but we think these drivers are employees, not contractors. And here's an invoice for four years of uh, payroll taxes plus penalties and interest. Super Shuttle paid that invoice. Super Shuttle is owned by a French conglomerate, a large one. And it took a couple years thereafter before Super Shuttle decided to file suit against the state of California to recover those monies. And long story short, Super Shuttle prevailed in that lawsuit, which was decided in 2017. The next year, the California Supreme Court in the Dynamex case, which has gotten a lot of notoriety, redefined the criteria for determining whether a person providing <clears throat> labor services is or is not an independent contractor. And the second of those three criteria, known as the ABC test, B is the second one, basically says the independent contractor providing services must be providing separate and distinctive services <clears throat> from those normally or typically provided by the business. Under that criterion alone, most businesses would fail the test and thus their employees would have to be converted to, their independent contractors would have to be converted to employees. The very next year in 2019 in September, the state of California, the legislature passed a bill known as AB5. It was signed into law by Governor Newsom, which is aimed at those who drive for ride share and or food delivery companies, the DoorDashes of the world, the Ubers of the world. And this new law specifically seeks to have the independent contractor drivers for those companies reclassified as employees. The list of exemptions or carve outs as the law uses that phrase in that law are many and varied. Most professionals, uh, the law doesn't apply to. The hairstylists and beauty salon operators, the law does not apply to. Nail salon folks, it doesn't apply to. Tow truck drivers, it doesn't apply to. But it applies, is aimed at these gig economy companies and those who drive for them. You may be familiar with some of the arguments on both sides of this matter. As a result of this, several companies earlier this year banded together and decided to seek a uh, proposition to put on the California ballot. And wouldn't you know that they were able to collect more than a million signatures and thus this November, uh, Californians will vote on Proposition 22 to preserve the independent contractor status of drivers <clears throat> for these types of gig economy companies, rideshare and food delivery. And an analysis that we did in conjunction with this matter shows that if those drivers were in fact to be converted to employees, the consequences would probably be greatest for the drivers and they would be negative rather than positive because these companies would most likely not hire more than 15 to 20% of the people who currently provide independent contracting services and even with that set of percentages, the prices of those services would rise substantially. So the voters will have a chance to express themselves on this key issue. And you can decide for yourself, we have a polling question about it, I'll put up shortly, uh, about whether we're going to see more class actions in an area we've already seen a lot of, which is independent contractor versus employee status. Let me turn briefly now to the matter of uh, executive compensation. This is an enormously interesting area. Um, it's sometimes one that is hard to see the litigation that actually occurs here because much of this involves privately owned companies. Much of it involves family owned companies. And I'm gonna give you a couple uh, of examples. 
um, <clears throat> in, without naming the company, a very prominent beer distributing company based in Oklahoma created a, uh, a uh, subsidiary company in the Virgin Islands and its management of the company provided management services and was compensated for it. The Internal Revenue Service came along and said it didn't believe those services were provided. The compensation should not serve as a deduction for income tax filing purposes. And the IRS imposed uh, five years worth of penalties, taxes and interest, taxes, penalties and interest on that company, which then somewhat like in the super shuttle case, a couple of years later sued the IRS to recover those monies. And the issue there, which the court uh, focused on very considerably was the reasonableness <clears throat> or unreasonableness of the amount of compensation paid to those executives. And it's this reasonableness criterion that is at play in all of these executive compensation cases. And there is no single definition of reasonableness uh, in these cases. The narrowest test is the one factor test, the independent investor test. Would you and I, if we had some money to invest in a company, knowing what the executives were paid, <clears throat> go ahead and invest in that company? If so, we think their compensation is reasonable. If we don't, we think it's unreasonable. At the under, other end of the spectrum is a 12 factor test has been used in particular by some Texas courts that says, well, you've got to look at not only would people invest in the company, but what kind of company is this? How long has it been in business? What is its industry? What is its structure? What is its major product or services? What are its major competitors? And so forth. Um, the type of case I just mentioned about the beer distributorship is one type. Let me give you a couple of other examples. A privately owned pharmaceutical company sold its main business to another privately owned pharmaceutical company for a little over a billion dollars. This is uh, three years ago. And uh, the CEO and COO, father and son, received transaction bonuses, <clears throat> which aren't all that unusual, in fact, they're quite common, of about 50 million together. They also received something that is more unusual, historical underpayment bonuses, about 25 million, 75 million in total. The sister of the son, the daughter of the CEO, a shareholder in the company, sued both of them individually and the company for excluding her from the decision to sell and from having a say in the amounts of both the transaction bonuses and the uh, historical underpayment bonuses. And then in another example, in a, yet a different industry, in the energy industry, there is a privately owned oil company with uh, three brothers, two of whom are the CEO and COO respectively. The third brother just gets his capital gain distribution every year and regularly sues his two brothers claiming they are overcompensated. He's created a lot of business for lawyers and for consultants like us, but it's, these are examples of this executive compensation milieu in which we see individual litigation. Now the question that I want to address in my final two minutes or so is will we be likely to see these kinds of matters converting into or becoming subject to class actions? Uh, I think it is rather likely is my own answer to the question. Uh, a few years ago, uh, the Security Investor Protection Corporation in New York, Irving Picard trustee, sued Bernard L. Madoff Investment Securities, LLC, and specifically Mark Madoff and Andrew Madoff, the two sons, both of whom are deceased, who were the co-directors of the proprietary trading division of BLMIS. And the trustee wanted to know if those two executives were overpaid, unreasonably paid, over a 10-year period. If they were, he was going to attempt to claw back the amount of money involved and redistribute it to some of the claimants to BLMIS funds. So in that instance, and by the way, he did find, uh, we found in our work in that matter, that the two sons earned between 600 and 800% more than the next two highest paid executives in comparable size firms in the same industry, 
though those were public firms, not private firms. And so the trustee was able to claw back a little over a billion dollars and redistribute it to other claimants. That's not a class action per se, but the trustee is representing large numbers of investors. So you could think of that as a class. And then uh, finally, uh, you can think of shareholders, customers, even vendors, bringing class action lawsuits against companies in the belief that those executives are overpaid. And ironically, the ESG movement, the environmental, uh, social and governance movement uh, is actually a fulcrum upon which some of those cases may hinge. So that concludes uh, my remarks and we have a few minutes left for discussion and uh, comment. And I wanna also uh, launch uh, a poll that uh, deals with the two matters that uh, I just uh, addressed. Uh, Randy, uh, Seth, any additional comments that you might have? No, David, I, this is Randy. Um, it was interesting to see on the, on the one poll where uh, people felt, uh, I don't have it in front of me, but people felt that ERISA preemption was going to remain strong or only be moderately impacted. Um, I certainly hope that's the case. Uh, but I also know that, you know, states and uh, localities are very actively trying to erode it and uh, regulate uh, a lot of these um, ERISA covered plans. So uh, I, I hope the, uh, the folks uh, in the audience are, are correct that it's not going to impact that much. Uh, well, I'll put up those poll numbers in just a moment, uh, uh, Randy. Um, Seth, uh, any uh, additional comments that you might uh, might have? Yeah, similarly, I, I saw, I think it was nearly 90% of the, the, res the responses uh, found that um, wage and hour class um, collective actions were likely to at least moderately increase um, post-COVID. And I think... Um, uh, I guess it, it a shows that I'm not um, I'm not crazy, but uh, b shows that people are really paying attention to this issue and and understanding that they need to make sure that their their practices um, are compliant and and are going to be expecting that these cases will be will be uh, coming. Right, and uh, I think you may be able to see this on your screen. I'm sharing the polling results for. One of your questions there, Seth, which of the following best year describes your estimate of the effect of COVID-19 related changes in the workplace uh, will have on the amount of wage and hour class action litigation? And uh, the majority of respondents, 58% said a moderate increase, but 30% expect a large increase. Only uh, 3%, uh, one person apparently, uh, thought there would be a moderate decrease and no change was about uh, 9%. And let's move to the uh, other question that was associated with your presentation, uh, Seth. <clears throat> and there, uh, what's the likelihood that FF FLSA collective action will decrease given the uncertain legal landscape? Uh, modestly likely, 56% of the respondents uh, marked that. Only 9% highly likely and 35% highly unlikely. Turning now to uh, the answers to the questions associated with, Ran uh, with Randy's comments. Here is the one on which of the following types of ERISA class action lawsuits do you expect to increase? Um, no, wait, let's go back. Stop sharing that one. Get to Randy's <clears throat> share results. And uh, 13% said retirement plans, 28% said health plans. This is what you were referring to before, right. uh, Randy, although together it is uh, 54%. And then let's look at the response to the other question associated with your presentation, which was about preemption. Um, a slight majority, 55%, uh, said no change, but 41% thought there would be uh, uh, stronger ERISA preemption in the future, which is an interesting uh, finding to say the least. Yeah, I hope they're right. Uh, <laughs> and then let's take a brief look at uh, the class action business here. Uh, well, this is the response. Now let's one more. 
Uh, let's see, class action. I'm gonna try here. Which of the following best describes your estimate of the likelihood that class action litigation over independent contractor versus employee status will increase? That's about 50% modestly likely and 41% highly likely, only 9% said highly unlikely. And I think what I may do here, since we have one other question, let me launch that and see if we can get any other, any other uh, comments about that one and uh, contractors. So, so one last thing on the, the yeah. Uh, decrease in um, FLSA um, uh, collective actions. Um, I think the majority of people uh, said that they expected maybe a, a modest decrease. I think that makes sense because I think the um, the sort of uncertain landscape may may disincentivize some some plaintiffs' counsels from bringing collective actions, knowing that there could be this jurisdictional issue that could um, stop these large cases dead in their tracks and make it much more lucrative. Um, so the time will tell, but I do think it could act as a, uh, a disincentive. Right. Um, Barbara Hart has submitted a question, uh, which is, so are you saying that compensation will not be insulated by the business judgment rule? Uh, my answer to that is, uh, I think you can't be certain that it will be insulated by the business judgment rule. The definitions of the factors that go into making decisions in the courts on what is and is what is not reasonable compensation vary a great deal and so insulation in my judgment i, I wouldn't uh, i wouldn't necessarily count on it here is uh the result of the uh question about uh, executive compensation being increasingly subject to class actions a modestly likely 52%, highly likely 29%. So that's about 80% of the respondents here think that the likelihood is uh, from modest to high, which is a, a, a most interesting and perhaps notable finding. Um, any uh, final comments that uh, uh, you would have, uh, Randy or Seth? And anything, by the way, of follow-up? Oh, I should say to our, uh, to our audience that to the extent that you want to discuss any of the matters uh, that we've been uh, presenting today further, uh, you can feel free to contact us. Uh, um, our contact information is available. We also, I might say, purposely chose not to use uh, any slides for this session. Um, I don't know about you all, but we have been PowerPointed to death, so we made that uh, decision uh, in terms of preparing for this, uh, for this session. Let's see if we have anything in the chat. And there's the last poll result we thought that we would share uh, with you. Well, we very much appreciate uh, the opportunity to uh, be with you all uh, today. There's well over 100 attendees, as we can see from the participant information. Uh, there is, of course, a third uh, day of the CAME conference, which will take place tomorrow with opening remarks at uh, 11 a.m. Eastern. And uh, you can see the topics there when you click on it. Um, our next session uh, here is on data technology and privacy. And Jeff, should I turn it back to you, Jeffrey Clank? Or should I turn it over to Amy Worley? Well, I'll pick it up from here, Dave. Oh, thank you, will. you for that. Okay. Yes, and, and thank you very much for that discussion. David, Seth, and Randy, thank you. Thank you. Thank Our you. RISA labor employment cases are very important matters, and we could have talked even longer about that subject.